Tracy's left. I think she's gone. I think he said it was today. Good evening. Welcome to the Bossier Parish Library's History Center. I'm Pam Carlisle. I'm the assistant manager here. It's great to have crowds here again. Uh, if you would, you probably have already, but um, there's a sign-in sheet on the little table right outside the door if you wouldn't mind signing in. And if you would like to find out about future uh, programs or events here at the History Center, if you write down your email and check the little box that says it's okay for us to put you on our email list, then uh, please check that box and you'll find out about all our future programs. And this presentation tonight is being recorded. It's also being streamed live on Facebook. And you can follow us on Facebook, by the way. So, uh, so we actually have two audiences, uh, you all here and one with folks watching from home, no matter where that is. And from what I understand, I think you've got some folks watching from around the country. So we are very lucky to have here Dr. Gary Joyner. Dr. Joyner is professor of history at Louisiana State University in Treeport, where he holds the Marianne and Leonard Selber Professorship in History and serves as chair of the Department of History and Social Sciences. He's also at LSUS, the director of the Strategy Alternatives Consortium and director of the Red River Regional Studies Center. He's here to talk um, about, as a special presentation for the Bossier Parish Library's summer experience that has the theme, Oceans of Possibilities, the Confederate Naval Base in Treeport. So thank you so much, Dr. Joyner, for coming tonight. Glad to be here. I, I always like coming here. The, the, the folks that come to these things get it, if that makes any sense. Um, it's not like teaching freshmen, <laughs> which is much like getting ducks to precision march with similar results. All right, so, and Sally's gonna be my, my uh, slide changer. And so uh, let's, let's get into this. Go ahead. You know, we look downtown, our downtowns, Shreveport and Bossier. We, we drive through it, we look at the river, we pass over the river, we look at Cross Bayou, and it's just part of us. It's part of what makes us us. But my question to you is, do we see what's there when we look at it? And the answer to that is usually no. Not because we're lackadaisical or hopefully we're not driving and putting other lives in threat as we go, look at that. We don't, you know, that's not it. What happened before and how can we tell what's there using technology? So, we're going to look at Shreveport. We're going to look at the maps that were around here. Some of them, important maps. Not widely seen. A couple that are uh, awfully hard to find. They're, they're in one of my books and a map that no longer exists, and it just kills my heart to say that. And I'll tell you why, I'll show you why. So, 1863, Shreveport becomes capital of Louisiana for the Confederacy. It will surrender two months after Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox. Um, with all of the Juneteenth coverage that we've seen our Juneteenth was June 6th of 1865. That's when the Navy came up and took uh, control of the waterway. The Army came in two days later on transports and took control again. So we surrendered twice, much like Natchez did, with similar results. Alexandria was burned to the ground during the Red River campaign. Shreveport, they didn't get here. So all of our buildings were intact. So 
that's where we're going to start. The courthouse was then the state legislature. The courthouse square was where the state legislature was. They used the Caddo Courthouse. With the exception of that building, there were no buildings in Shreveport more than two stories. Okay, now that's sort of normal. There were houses that had balconies, that kind of thing. But no building in Shreveport, you could not stand on the roof and look down at what was going on at Cross Bayou. And the Army and the Navy didn't want you to do it. So most reporters had very little idea. They knew about things, but they didn't know about other things. Sally? So, we have written records. We have map. Now, come back a little bit. Do the previous slide. If you can. Yeah, I just I want to go through and talk about some of these. So what we do is, uh, we beside written records, we want to use maps that exist, particularly 19th century maps, which are wonderful. Most people in this room are familiar with USGS topo maps. You're going to see an example of each one of these, and then government photography, which is not great. <laughs> Commercial photography is much better, but I specifically wanted to use government photography to show you what's going on and how you have to deal with certain amounts of data. And then there's this new stuff that I think is wonderful. It's better than sliced bread. It's just <coughs> cool. And I am a geek. I'm about as geeky as you can get. That's LIDAR, light detection and ranging. It is half science and half witchcraft. It, it is. You know, it's like a thermos bottle. You know, it keeps cold stuff cold, hot stuff hot, but how does it know? <laughs> does that bother y'all? It bothers me. It just bothers me. And then there's cadastral data, which are little lines. In our case, we're going to be looking at, you're just going to see assessor, tax assessor's data. And then there's elevation contours, which are little wire grids. So as you go up a hill, these things are like slices in a cake, right? So the elevations are always constant, but the size of them is different. So if you're used to using seven and a half minute topo maps, they're 10 feet apart. Well, that is coarse. With this, with LIDAR, and I, I can make them, I have the software to do it, or I can pull them out of libraries, uh, we can do two-foot contours. So suddenly we can see where streams used to be, not where they are now. And then high resolution, I use Google as an example, Google Earth, which is great, but we've got much better stuff. And if I can get you to get me the Department of Defense to let me use some stuff, we can get down to two centimeters. <laughs> okay. They won't let me do it, but they might let you. All right, Sally. This is, and I want you to see something as I go through this. This is not going to change in the first set, and then there's going to be another set that I'm using as a blow up. This is a constant scale. So what I've done, I built a GIS, or Geographic Information System, uh, project of this, and all of this is done in layers. So I can turn layers on, I can turn layers off. I can also make them translucent. If they're transparent, they go away and it's useless. But I, I can, depending on how much color I want to shoot through it, I can make it where it's just a little bit, you can see a, a tinge of something, or I can do it where the outlines appear. So as you can tell, this is Downtown Shreveport and Bossier City doesn't go all the way out to city limits because that's pretty useless for our discussion. But you can see the, the roads and you can see the water. Okay, So this is something called World Street Map. This stuff's free. You just have to have a program that will read it. Now, if you've got a uh, navigation system in your car and as your maps move, that's the basis. It may not look like it, but that's the basis. Okay. 
And here is a seven and a half minute topo map, four of them. And here's one of the problems you have when you're dealing with older government material. These were all printed maps that were then scanned and the whole United States has been put together. That's the good news. The bad news is notice that the upper right one is much darker than the other three. That was a printing error. And if you order one from the United States Geological Survey or the Corps of Engineers, it's still going to be dark because they decided not to change it. So if I'm doing a report and it's at that junction, I end up having to explain, not my fault, I'm better than that. <laughs> Just say. Okay. And this is federal photography. It's coarse, it's light, it's fuzzy, but it's accurate. So the important thing is, it's accurate. All right. Notice that they're all, this doesn't move. These are all off the same screen. This is LIDAR. I love this stuff. I mean, I do. So the hotter the color, the higher the elevation. The cooler the color, the lower the elevation. And I kept it in meters because that's what it likes, but I kept the distances in feet <coughs> because that's what I like. <laughs> and you can see, look at these little wiggly lines up here that there's nothing there, there's not water in it, and yet that was Red River at definable times. I use it all the time to find graves. I use it to find navigable stream beds uh, in court cases. And I use it to find Indian mounds and steamboat wallows and unmarked graves. And I'm still finding stuff I like to do with it. Sometimes it's just fun to play with it. My software will let me recreate floods. So. This is what's in existence today. I can uh, give it a, just a handful of commands and I can say, okay, water, you think you're at a certain elevation, but now you're going to be 12 feet higher. Let's see what the 1927 flood really did and not have to rely on records that are imperfect. Our 1927 flood was 1930 and it was bad. Um, in the greater scheme of things, it is not, you know, it, it happened here, but it didn't happen in Vicksburg the same way. So, you know, if I want to put 22 feet of water in it, I can show you, prove that in the 1927 flood, Shreveport was a peninsula. You only got into it from the west, otherwise you better be a duck. Okay, Sally. This is a cadastral map, Caddo Parish Tax Assessor's Office. I've got it for Bozier too, but I wanted you to see how Caddo looks. And all those little lines, if you, if you come in as close as you can down to one lot, I can interrogate any of them and I can see your tax records. Ooh. <laughs> They keep the prices off, but I can show who owns it and the size of it and, and what they say it is. And so these nice big squares, well, that's Cross Lake. And those are section boundaries, just like anything else. Okay. Again, this is the same. I only turned on one so you could see how sharp it is. These are two-foot elevation contours. Pretty complex, isn't it? I can take these, run it through the Global Mapper software, and it'll make LIDAR. And it'll be exactly what we get from the feds. Uh, it takes it a little while. The bigger you go, the more complex it is. But there's no color differentiation. There's the, the only thing that you end up with, because of the quality of these, is that at the seams, Water doesn't quite know if it's like this or if it's like this. And so I have to come in and tell it, it's okay, don't worry. You know, it, it'll, it'll go into a tizzy tailspin if you're not careful. Okay. We're going to use all this stuff, so 
You know, there will be a test at the end. <laughs> this is the global map image of the same area, exactly the same, but this is really good photography. Compare this against that NAIP federal stuff from the Department of Agriculture. And as you, if you've ever played with Google Earth, you know that you can go down even right on top of it. You, you can count, in some places, you can count roof tiles. It's that good. Okay. So, 1863 to 1865, Shreveport is pretty much a big deal. We have a population of pre- <coughs> Pre-war population of about 10 to 12,000 people. We have a lot of people living just outside the city limits. The city limits do not go far past downtown. Downtown was bustling. It is the command center for the Army of the Trans-Mississippi. All Confederate troops uh, in that period from the Mississippi River out to as far as Picacho Peak, Arizona, were theoretically run out of here. The Army of the Trans-Mississippi was here. The Confederate States Navy was based here because it was safe. And you'll see another point of that in a minute. But remember I said about those buildings? Nobody downtown could see what's happening down on Cross Bayou. Nobody. It wasn't in their line of sight, and I'll prove it in, in just a minute. So, they heard stuff. They heard a lot of banging. They knew things were going on, and they could see the surface vessels, including the Missouri, the model of it's over there. We'll look at that in a little while. But there were things going on that they knew they shouldn't be asking about, and they were polite, and they didn't ask about them. And then the people that knew after the war kept their secrets, which is another big deal, okay? So who built all this stuff, and what did they build? And this is General Brigadier General William Robertson Boggs, uh, fourth in his class at West Point. If you're in the top 10% of your class, you got to pick what you wanted to go in. Unless you were just, maybe daddy was an infantry officer. No, you went into engineers. Robert E. Lee was one of these. Grant was not. Nowhere near the top 10%. He's a genius. And I mean that in, in the true honored sense of the word. Look how young he is. This is about roughly from a carte de visite, a CDV, this is how he would have looked when he was in Shreveport. He was in his late 20s, and yet he was the chief of engineers and Kirby Smith's chief of staff. Okay, who else? He didn't do it all by himself. This is reputed to be, according to the Library of Congress, the last photograph of Confederate officers in the war. Taken in Shreveport, Louisiana. Their uniforms look good. They're engineers. They're officers. They're all West Point grads. And their buddies on the other side trying to take them out are all West Point grads. Now, <clears throat> there's seven guys there. There were more than that. There were uh, at least three more that were really, really good. Uh, one of them was Joseph Smith, and I don't have a photograph of him, but he, uh, he built the furthest out Shreveport defenses down at Tones Bayou. You can read the names. I don't have to do it, but my favorites in this guy on the left-hand side, sort of leaning. That's David French Boyd, who was... There have been two books written about him. You may have heard of him if you went to LSU. Uh, Boyd Hall, 
the two Boyd Halls, one for him, one for his brother. He was the, what we would today call a chancellor or president of LSU after the war. He taught with William Tecumseh Sherman at Pineville, at the Louisiana Seminary of Learning and Military Institute, grounds of which are still there today. And then seating on the left, right in front of him, is Major Richard Venable, who you'll hear a lot about. The guy next to Venable is a, a guy, at this time he's a major, he'll become a colonel, uh, chief of topographic engineers, that's Henry T. Douglas. Uh, I don't think I would have liked Douglas. I, I mean, I'd love to have had a conversation with some of the others, but not Douglas. Douglas could be prissy, um, and he was high strung. The third guy standing up is probably, he's the only one that's not identified in, in the uh, Library of Congress records, but I believe that is William DeVoe. And we'll see a lot about William DeVoe. But Venable and Douglas and DeVoe have a whole lot to do here. Uh, Boyd is unlucky in the, in the Red River campaign. He goes down to Natchitoches to check on one of the defensive projects, and he's captured and he spends the Red River campaign aboard a prison ship called the Polaris. And he tries to smuggle out what he knows to Richard Taylor. We have his letter. It exists. And he, it's got to pass censors. And nobody but Taylor or the other engineers would understand what he's talking about. He's telling Richard Taylor, you need to basically blow up Tones Bayou Dam. That's another talk. We're not going to do it today because it's not in Shreveport. But that's what trapped the Union Navy. He doesn't get to Shreveport until after the Yankees retreat. They sort of forgot about him, and he left. <laughs> he came back to Shreveport. If you go to the um, Rural Life Center in Baton Rouge, it's owned by LSU, you will find... Uh, a lot of his personal gear, you know, it's just, it's, it's like, wow, can I touch it? No? Okay. Then they let me touch it. All right. It was also what I term, and I think I'm, I'm correct in this, it's a top secret unit who were put here to protect them. Mobile, Alabama. The Singer Submarine Corporation, working for a guy named H.L. Hunley, built three submarines. Two of them end up in Louisiana. The third one, of course, goes to Charleston and is famous for being the first vessel, underwater vessel, to sink an enemy combatant. And then it was damaged and it sank with crew. It killed three crews. Well, when Charleston got hot from Union pressure, the Confederate Army said, you can't stay here, we're getting you out. And they, kept, they took them to the safest place in the entire Confederacy, which was Shreveport, Louisiana. And they brought their whole design crew, and they brought what we today would think of as fabricators. So now you've got some guys that build submarines, and they're bored. And so what do they do? They built submarines, hand-cranked submarines. I mean, that's all there was. They built five of them in Shreveport. One of them was dismantled and taken down what is today Highway 59, Houston, Galveston. It was reassembled. There is supposedly in Galveston a photograph, an archival photograph of that one. But we really, I mean, it would be fun to have it, but we really don't need it. Because we know that it was, they were,
copies of the Hunley, with one exception. The Hunley has two hatches for egress and ingress. Ours, I'm going to say it's ours because it's our area, has one. 40 feet long, 46 inches deep, 42 inches wide. And if you've ever been to the Hunley, they have a replica of the hatch. They would have to grease me up with lard <laughs> and then pop me through that and then I would be there because I would not be coming out. Okay. So what did they build? What did these engineers build? Richard Venable's map of the Shreveport defenses from 1864, showing the 64 blocks downtown, how the river was, how Cross Bayou was, and if you look, <clears throat> there's an arc that goes that way. It's three miles long, not including the forts that were in Bossier. There are four named forts, one in Bossier, three in Shreveport. There are four minor forts. There are 15 artillery batteries, which are forts. They're, uh, almost all of them are redans, or a combination of a redan and a lunette. We're not going to get into that, but they moved a lot of dirt. Edmund Kirby Smith, commander of everything in the West, loved dirt. Oh my God, he loved dirt. <laughs> dirt was cool. Think of any John Wayne movie, any John Wayne movie. Did it ever bother you that out in the middle of near desert, forts were made of sticks? <laughs> it is true. Yeah. Things like that just bug the fire out of me because I'm a historian and it, don't ever go to, with a, to a movie with me because I'm just and every historian I know is the same way damn it look at that <laughs> you know those epaulets are wrong or whatever you know well they made them out of dirt dirt's good you can mold dirt they, dirt absorbs cannonballs you can put you know firing steps behind it and shoot up over the dirt if it was good enough for Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans, it's good enough for these guys in Shreveport, Louisiana, right? So, notice this odd thing coming up. That's the edge of the page. This is corrected. Notice that this has not moved. I warped it because it was just ever so slightly off. Okay. And this is how they signed it. And the guy that did it misspelled his name. But the key to it is the date. The original, there were three originals. One stayed here. One went to the engineer, Venable. And the third one was the official copy that went to Richmond. Now, when Richmond was taken, the chief cartographer, chief topographic engineer of the entire Confederacy was a guy named Jeremy Gilmer. Remember that, because you're going to be <laughs> tested on it. Gilmer, as Richmond was falling, realized that if he didn't save a lot of the stuff that he wanted to take with him, the Yankees would burn it. So he had, I'm not sure who did it, it doesn't really matter, maybe a wife, maybe an assistant, maybe a seamstress. He had a western duster, a great coat. And on the inside of it, his back, his sides, and down the panels in the front were pockets and he folded up every map he thought was important and he took it with him back to North Carolina where he did nothing with them. <laughs> and then he died. 
many years later. And his family says, you know, Daddy had all these things. They, I don't know if they're worth anything, but we don't want them. Oh, I cringe. Then they did something right. They asked the University of North Carolina if they wanted them. And North Carolina, not being stupid, said, well, yes. Where they sat in the Southern Historical Collection for decades upon decades upon decades because nobody had looked at them. They weren't cataloged, or at least not finitely cataloged. They were given numbers and letters, and that's it. So we thought that map is the only one in existence about Shreveport, Louisiana. Okay. That's how much it's off. Now it's true north. I did that. <laughs> okay. Remember this guy, Douglas? Remember DeVoe? So after the war, they stayed here. Douglas became sort of a contract builder. He left after that. But DeVoe loved Shreveport loved it, and he became the city surveyor. And just before Yellow Fever hit in 1873, he finished a project for the city, and he platted, mapped everything in the city, and what they thought the expansion would be for several years out. So we have because of this guy, we have a map that is perfect, that shows Shreveport at the hour of our greatest need, when a quarter of the population dies due to yellow fever. And we've got the original at LSUS. And notice he signed it, W.R. DeVoe, city surveyor. 1873. Okay. I got to give him a plug because, well. <laughs> so, we've talked about the submarines. This Navy Yard along Cross Bayou uh, went from the mouth of the Red River all the way over to North Common. Now, that's a pretty big stretch. And we've looked for the submarines, the four left, and I can tell you where they are not. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Edison said, somebody asked him about the light bulb, Mr. Edison, how do you feel about failing 999 times before you got a light bulb to work? He said, I didn't fail. They were just practice, and I know what not to do. So I, I don't have to go back and look for them anymore. I know where they're not. And the guy that has helped me, Ralph Wilbanks, and the late Clive Cussler, who financed it, sent Ralph and his crew up here, and we went out in a boat. A, calling it a boat's like, that's ridiculous. It's like a science lab floating, and we used... Uh, cesium magnetometers and side scan sonars and we found other stuff. We found one of Patton's tanks from the 41 maneuvers. <laughs> right where it is. Not going to move. It's an M3 Stewart. It's sitting under 22 feet of water and below that about 10 to 12 feet of silt because it's a tank. <laughs> right? And it's in mud and it's filled up with mud. And we know that because Patton cheated. Can you imagine Patton cheating? And he, he took Shreveport illegally, according to the rules of the maneuvers. And uh, so General MacArthur was the judge, and he said, no, you cheated, so you lost. Patton didn't mind. He said, I know how to fight a war. Patton ordered the guys in his uh, scout tank platoon to cross, cross Bayou from the north. He was in Agers. 
and Patton was using a relatively recent 1940 Texaco roadmap, which showed cross by you as a single little blue line. So Patton didn't think it was that big, and he told him to just button up everything, rev it up, and go across that thing and, and take the city water supply, which was the McNeil Street pump station, because you get that, you win the war. When you get a city, if you can cut off the water, people are going to go, I'm thirsty. Well, 2 o'clock in the morning, using a carbide lantern, it didn't look that bad. And they buttoned up this tank, but the, the, the guy who was in charge of filling the ammunition left the ammo filler door open. And it became a submarine. They popped out the hatches, everybody got out, everything's fine. We found it uh, when we were doing side scan sonar looking for the submarines. Still there, it's okay. It is just north, right in front of the McNeil Street pumping station, the Waterworks Museum, which was an old steamboat landing. And when Patton saw it, he says, we can go right up there, it's a little bitty road. Everybody said, yes, General. We found refrigerators, we found coils of rope, we found a really fine aluminum extension ladder. <laughs> we also found parts of one of the um, ships that was in the Confederate Navy. We found the remnants of the Grand Duke. Now. It's right in the middle of the main channel today. Then it was backed up into a slough. It burned Christmas Day, or close to Christmas Day, 1863, burned right down to the water. The machinery survived. We were able to see one of the crown sprockets. It was a side wheeler. We found, uh, we could see some of the logging chain, hogging chains that used to warp steamboats. Uh, Every time there's a flood, it pushes soil away from it. And then as the flood stops, it dumps more soil on top of it. So I've got a great image of that, what we saw. It's still there. We're not going to pull it up. Why, you may ask? Once it hits air, it will begin to fall apart. And so leaving something in situ is better if you don't have funding to go fix it. Okay. So Shreveporters have no idea about these subs. You would think that they're, they're such cool looking things. You know, everybody would know about them. They didn't see them. And because they were hand cranked, they didn't hear them. Okay, Sally. That's what it looked like. That's my model. I didn't build it. Bill Adderidge built it long. Now, now deceased. Exact scale copy. Uh, exactly like the Hunley. Even down to the deployment booms to stab an enemy vessel and then back off. Um, it's at the Spring Street Museum if you want to see it. Okay, so now we know where the Navy Yard is, and we know we've got some cool layers we can look at, so let's do it. Let's analyze it. Here's our World Street Map again. Notice that it's in about 50%, meaning that it's one quarter of the size. So there's more detail. You can see Cross Bayou. That big blue pond out there is Swepco's Settlement Pond, which in 1863 was a slough, and in 1873 had filled up with rainwater, and that's where the mosquitoes were breeding for yellow fever. Okay? So now we're going to look at some layers and see how they work. Next one. Here's the Venable map. 
nice and tight so you can see the Navy Yard. And you'll see that there's a foundry, there's two sawmills, there's an arsenal, there's also barracks around that foundry. And why else would you put troops in barracks if you didn't have something to guard? The answer is you wouldn't. Okay. So here's our federal photography and I have uh, taken the Venable map and I made it translucent. And I said to the map, and it's very obedient. I wish my daughter was that obedient. I told, I told the, uh, the Venable map that everything on that map that is white is now clear. And so anything that's on the map that's not on what was on the printed page as white or even beige, because it had aged, now I can see through it. And look at Cross Bayou. It's not exactly the same because we've had some floods. There have been some detritus compilations or things where, you know, here particularly, this is soft and so it's filled in. But look at this and look at that. Those are ravines. Guess where they built the subs? We have found slag down there like you would not believe. I hate to think about this because the Jones Brothers foundry did the work, did the fabricating, and they may have actually melted them down after the war because they needed iron. Or there's some place that I hadn't found yet. If we find one, we'll find four. We know that as the Union was coming in, the Navy and then the Army, that there was a human chain of people who went to the arsenal, right in here. This is the McNeil Street pumping station. This is where Patton's tank is, right there. Sorry, Your Honor. And this human chain, men and women, boys and girls, they took all the guns that were in the arsenal and they handed them down to somebody else and they threw them in the cross body. We found remnants on the magnetometer. So, the ravines have not eroded. And they could build them end on inside the ravines. And they still exist. That's where the, the horse, uh, SPD horse yard was, stables and stuff. Actually, more than stables. It was a little training ground. It's all out there. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the next. Here it is with contours on it in the World Street Map. So you can see any place that was hard has stayed the same. And any place that was soft either was pushed away or it remains in sort of the same position. One thing that has not changed anywhere is right here. That's where Sam's Town is. It sits on a Pleistocene coastwise terrace, meaning that it's a hard place. Even going back to the Ice Age, the Pleistocene Ice Age, the baby Ice Age. And we've, we, um, we're able to work on that before the hotel was built. We found a locomotive. Cool. Under Sam's. They wouldn't let me. Mikado. Biggin. 
They wouldn't let us do anything. Well, I found the, <laughs> I found the turntable spindle, took pictures of it, and we covered it back up. It's under the hotel. Um, and we just, we kept on finding things that are, that make too much sense. But, you know, you can think, you know, y'all know what pointillism is in art? Where, you know, you make a, a picture, but it's all out of little bitty dots. Well, I got dots and no lines, just like LiDAR. I got dots out the wazoo. But I can't, at this point, make all the dots fit together. My, and, and see a larger picture because I'm right up to them. I'm looking at dots or metal, slag, pellets, glass, locomotive. Okay. Now look at it over LiDAR. Oh, I love LiDAR. Have I said that? <laughs> I love LiDAR. Warping the Venable map to where it really is in the world. And it's, it's got about 500 points that tack it down to where it ought to be, right? Two-foot contours. Look. Look at those ravines. They're there now. They were there then. This is that low shelf that you see just west of Clyde Fant that goes down. It says sawmill. Why would you put a sawmill right there? Well, they were floating logs out. Okay. But it's rectangular. That's where they built the Missouri. It is the only place on Cross Bayou that they could build the Missouri. Not only that, but we have the records from Jonathan Carter, who was the Navy commander, who talked about, and boy, he hated accountants. I love this man. He hated accountants. Why did, now, and I have friends that are accountants. My brother-in-law is an accountant. But... He hated the fact that he couldn't do anything without somebody telling him that they had to tell him, to, he had to tell them how many nails they bought. How much did you rent mules for by the day? How can you reconcile getting railroad iron from today, the town of Greenwood, then two, four miles to the west, and who do you, who are you going to pay back? He said, just let me do it. I'll build these things. We'll win the war. Oh, no, not until you sign off. He hated accountants. He talks about the sawmills, the foundry, the corn sheds feeding his men, clothing his men, doing everything he needed to. It's wonderful. It's all in the National Archives. The late great judge, Catherine Brash Jeter, wrote a book on him. And it's his day book. And she told me about it. I had to go up to D.C. to do another project. And so I went in behind her and I, and I read his day book, his journal, and of course she was exacting, she was brilliant jurist, at least in my opinion, but she knew her stuff and she was a really good historian. She missed something, and I'm going to, I'm going to brag on me because it was pure dumb luck, and if I, said, if I said that it was my master plan, I'd be lying through my teeth. <coughs> She wasn't sure because before she died, we didn't know really if these subs were here. Remember that he is over everything with the Navy. The subs were under him. I found another set of data at the National Archives that has to do with the singers. Off to the side. Another set of dots, no lines collecting them or connecting them. 
she's writing everything he said, everything he wrote, and I was able to talk to her about this, and, and, and it was one of my favorite conversations in my entire life. Kay, and she was very hard of hearing. Kay, I think I found something. Well, actually, you found it, but I think I know what it is. What? <laughs> so I yelled, got hoarse, and I said, he gives proof of the submarines. I would have seen that, Gary. Can't you just hear? I would have seen that, Gary. I said, go to page so-and-so, told her what page it was. She looked at it. The singers were famous for doing something else. They made mines. The singers built the mine that blew up the Cairo in the Yazoo the year before. Okay. The Confederates invent the mines. There's no rule book. So they could call them anything they wanted to. And the engineers were all scientists. A lot of them were, were physical scientists. And so one of the singers said, I got a great name, a great name for our minds. Okay, what do you want to call them? You get to name it. You created it. What do you want to call it? Torpidae. It's not catchy. It didn't go. <laughs> torpidae. Torpidae? A manta ray is a torpidae. A stingray is a torpidae. Huh. That's pretty cool. Still not too... So they said, let's anglicize it some. How about torpedo? So mines were called torpedoes. Put it out in the water, anchor it down, something goes over it, bam, it's gone. They and these guys were really overachievers. So they created three different kinds. One is a percussion type where contact, it hits a hull, and it blows up. That's the most common type in World War I. Right. The second type is anchored in its proximity mine, and it has a little magnet magnetometer in it. And so if there's iron near it, it'll blow up. And then the third, those worked sort of because every Union vessel in the West had a wooden hull. You had to get right over it. And then the lip of the iron cladding might do it. But the third kind worked like a Timex watch. What does it take? You have to have a mine. Got to have some gunpowder in it. Have to figure out how to float it so they use cow bladders. <coughs> How's that for high tech? Blow them up like a balloon. And two wires running out of it over under the water over to the shore and right behind some place where you could hide. And the most important part, other than the powder and the cow bladder, and maybe some other stuff, <laughs> was a telegraph key. And they had a battery. And so the vessel comes up near it, and here the guy is slinking, and as soon as it gets over the right place, they tap send and Bam! That thing goes off. Thus, the Cairo sank in about eight feet of water. So what's that got to do with K. Jeter's translation, transcription? I said, K, just don't even read it. Let me read it to you. And since there was no word for submarine, the engineers were so enthralled with torpedae Multiple, multiple, there are four. Carter wrote, the torpedoes went out. And after sunset, they returned. I said, okay, mines don't do that. <laughs> she said, and, and justifiably, she said, well, I, I just thought that, you know, somebody went out and got them. Why would you do that? The damn thing might blow you up. I suppose you're right. 
Yes. Next. Ah. 1873, the Red River Raft has come back. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers comes here and takes out the raft. And there is, in the, in the first case of an embedded journalist slash photographer in the history of the United States, with the Corps of Engineers unit is a man named R.B. Talfor. We have all of his photographs. There were three sets. He, he was bored. He hand-tinted most of them, but not four that he did downtown. He got on the Bossier side, and he shot four images of downtown Shreveport. 1905, the Corps of Engineers thought they were so cool, they did the same thing. So now we can check 1873 from 1905. This is his northernmost one, and I'd cropped it. Cross Bayou is labeled by him. <clears throat> Looking at Bozier, the left side by the sea is the line of the naval base. The big building in the back, way back, is the foundry, and the building in the front is the Jones Brothers sawmill that you can see on the 1864 defense map. And you look at it, you'll see, see two black lines coming out? This was shot between August 12th and August 20th, 1873. That is the ruby that had been hauling cattle down from Jefferson, Texas. And the ruby sank with 100 head of cattle, 90 head ran up that bank, which must have been something. The bank's about 15 feet, by the way. You can scale it. That's another reason we know that you couldn't see down, because it was hidden by the lip of the bank. And 10 head died, and it was an insurance thing, and nobody wanted to remove the cattle. And it's August. And some of the African Americans down living on the lip of the west side of downtown thought, boy, what a waste of hides. And so they went in and harvested the hides and left the meat. And it got even worse. Townspeople got mad. First of all, who owns all these cattle just wandering around town like they own the place <laughs> and pooping prodigiously? And so they got some of the African Americans and they tarred and feathered them and sent them out of town. This is a perfect time capsule for what we can see, what we know happened. It's proof that Venable wasn't just drawing little lines, who knew where it went. Okay. So inquiring minds might want to know. How, how in the world did the people in Shreveport not know about these submarines? I'm going to show you. Jonathan Carter, lieutenant, our hero, figured out how to do it. First thing is, remember that people, even on roofs, could not see over the lip of the plateau of downtown down into Cross Bayou. Submarines, I know this is a stretch, but submarines go below the surface of the water. <laughs> Nine men, eight rowers, really pulling like an old drill, and one guy telling them what to do. Let's go. So, way out of the view of anybody living in Shreveport, way out of the view, the engineers built what the common term in engineering was a raft. A raft might be a pontoon bridge, it might be a dam, it might be a log jam, it could be any number of things. It was brilliant. Guy 
Google Earth. Red River, appropriately red when they, this true color. And look at that sort of orange looking arrow. That's where they built the obstruction. Did they want to dam up the Red River? What does that mean? Could they, could they then obviously stop the Yankees from coming up? But does that mean that they couldn't extend southward and go past it? If it was a dam, even if it was made of logs, there would be flooding in Shreveport, wouldn't there? Because the river's still flowing no matter what you're doing. Okay, let's do the next one. Here's a Venable map, close up. Orange arrow is where it's supposed to be. You see a little double line right by the point. And what does it say? Can you read what it says? Raft. Cool. Yeah. At this point, I'm getting epiphany marks like bam, 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 bam. My synapses are just. I don't know. I'm shooting out endorphins. Okay? Here it is on the federal photography. Notice the river's moved. The bottom of the river in 1864 is where Clyde Fant is. That's the Frisbee golf course. That's Veterans Park. So anybody that's been looking in the river is looking in the wrong place. And you can see that it went right across the river, perpendicular to the flow, which should have really caused some flooding. Not glancing off of it. How in the world did they do it? Remember our friend Jeremy Gilmer and those long forgotten maps that nobody looked at? LIDAR proves that it was on that this is underground without a doubt notice that there's a little square beside it, it says bat yule that's battery yule battery yule was a square fort designed to protect that raft and where the VA hospital is today was the largest of the four forts called Fort Turnbull from the guy that owned the southernmost plantation on the Red River. Today, Turnbull Island is what's left of it. The guns, in, including the log guns that, you know, one of the Confederate generals said this place is nothing but a humbug and it stuck. Well, they had real guns too. And they're aimed slightly downstream and they are looking down at this obstruction to protect it. So it had to be something really important, right? Why would you put that much effort into protecting something that was just a humbug? So, among these are maps 198A and 198B. And the good people at Wilson Library and their archives made me copies of everything in the Gilmer collection that was under a subtitle of Venable. We don't have one map. We have 30. We have the engineering schematics of his forts all the way up to Foreman, Arkansas. He also went out to the Battle of Mansfield in Pleasant Hill less than a week afterwards, and so he mapped how the battlefields looked, where the houses are. He even drew in the rows that had been planted. He went to every copse of trees, every fence, snake fence, that was built. And hiding in plain sight, this is 198B. I would have done them differently, but this is 198B. There's the obstruction. And look at the upper right, and who signed off on it? H.T. Douglas. He did the final approval before it went to Richmond. 
And notice something else about it. It floated. This is sanitation engineering, folks. Think of the wands in a sewer pond that stirs up all the muck. It doesn't go all the way down. The muck gets to go under it. The river gets to go under it. You could deploy the submarines downstream without ever opening it. How's that for cool? You can see, looking down at it, you can see it on the edges. There are uh, two very large wooden combination casements that hold it all together. And you're going, okay, well, how do you get boats through it? What if somebody comes up the river? Do they have to stop and then walk another, by river miles, about six miles? No. No. Remember, these are engineers. And they are tickled to death to be engineers. They exude engineer. Look at this. Notice the little wiggly arrow coming down. Look at that. It's a trapezoid. It's a trapezoid made of logs that have been hewn, bound together, and the river water pushes it right down into the middle of the dam. So they don't have to do anything to keep it in place. Even when there's no current, which there's always a current on the red, it stays in place. And notice also that under it, you can see little bitty anchors to hold everything in place. It's not one piece, it's three. One here, one here, and then a big wedge. Okay. That's how it worked. Mules on both shores pulling two sets of lines. All they have to do is pull it back, cock it to one side, the vessel goes through it, then they put the tension on the other side, and it flows right back in place. This thing is ram proof. It's too thick for a 19th century steamboat coming up stream to take it out. Gunfire is another matter, but not ramming. That's an elegant solution. Okay. So, did the Yankees know about it? Short answer is yes. Two things. In the official records, the OR, you will find a report in New Orleans from an, uh, an artillery officer. Somebody comes up to him and says, hey, if you go up Red River, they got stuff that's going to get you. He's an artillery officer. Okay, He understands artillery. He does not understand hand-cranked submarines. But he takes the report. And the report says, he asked the guy, how big is it? He said, 40 feet long, 46 inches deep, 42 inches wide, with a big paddle on each side, call that dive planes. And it holds three men. No, it held nine. Three guys could not wield those monsters. But nine can do it easily. So we know that exists in the official records. The final piece to the puzzle is something else. Uh, many of y'all knew Eric Brock. Eric was my best friend. And Eric's widow, at that time his fiance, was working for the state of Louisiana at the old U.S. Mint in New Orleans. And I was talking to Shannon and, and she said, I came across something that's just odd. And I thought you might like to look at it. And she faxed me, faxed me, an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper that looked like 
ants had been dipped in ink and then started walking all over it. And I called her and I said, Shannon, this is pretty bad. And she said, you ought to see the original. It's very light. And a candle had dropped over it and it's got wax on it. So I, I've never been able to do anything to match this. It, it, like I told you, I mean, dumb luck is a whole lot better than, you know, really trying to do something and beating your head against a wall. I took it, I took a fax, and I scanned it at 300 dots per inch. And then I ran it through Photoshop. And I changed the contrast. And guess what showed up? The spy map. It's on the back of a death certificate of a landsman, a Navy landsman. He's the guy that, he's not on board the boat. Sometimes they are, but in this case, he's at Cairo, Illinois. It is February 14th, 1864. Admiral David Dixon Porter is putting together his part of the Red River campaign's forces. He receives this guy and Porter really didn't believe him but he's very specific and I'm going to tell you that in, in, in my world I've got about an 80 percent probability of who this guy is. He had been a prisoner and had escaped according to him escaped Shreveport walked all the way across North Louisiana along what is today Highway 80, gets to Vicksburg, the Louisiana side of Vicksburg, picks up a Union boat which takes him up to Cairo, Illinois. That's where the Ohio comes into the Mississippi, the little pointy tip of Illinois. And this guy tells Admiral Porter, I'm a good Union man. His name was probably Wellington W. Withenberry. Isn't that a great name? Right out of Gilbert and Sullivan. He was the second licensed pilot, river pilot, on the Red River after Henry Shreve. He was from Cincinnati. So he draws this. Porter doesn't have anything to draw on, and so he flips over the second page of this poor landsman's death certificate. And this is what he draws. Now, something important. There's a lot of fanciful stuff on this. There was never a cannon foundry on the Bossier side, which he shows. He shows cannons all up in both, both sides. He shows where Wall's Texas Legion was. He, he, he's effusive. He talks about a good Union man living a few miles off that could help him you know, navigate some stuff. Well, why doesn't he show Cross Bayou? He never got up there. Oh, yeah. Notice there's a, a boat in the middle. Hit the next one, Sally. Rebel ram the web going down to Alexandria. The web is the Charles H. Webb. It was the most famous vanishing vessel in the western waters in the Civil War. The year before, it had sunk the ironclad Indianola. It had also cracked its keel when it did it. It goes, the Navy chases it. They're not as fast. It goes up the Red River where it is lost. Nobody knows where it is. It's at Shreveport where it was repaired. And after the Red River campaign, months after, the web makes what's called the dash to New Orleans. And it gets down to roughly Algiers and couldn't escape. It was trying to get to Havana, Cuba. That's not the web. 
He never saw the web. He doesn't know what the web looks like. There's only one image of the web. It's in a painting in New Orleans. It was a former New York Harbor ferry. And it was fast. That is the Missouri. How do you know? There's a model of the Missouri right over there, and if you compare them, they look just like. Why would this guy lie? Why would he put in fanciful stuff? Because Wellington W. Withenberry had leased several hundred acres of cotton land below Shreveport. His cotton was ready to harvest, and he didn't want the Navy to steal it. So he did his best at Natchitoches to pull banks to the west. And that's why you have battles at Mansfield and Pleasant Hill. And this is all congressional testimony. It's all over the place in the uh, volume two of the Joint Committee of the Conduct of the War. All these little dots just start coming together. And they form not only lines, but a fabric, and you can see how it works. So now we've got the technology to back up what the written record says, and we can see this arcing story of the Navy Yard. I think that's the last one. Yep, that's it. So, now you know. I love being a historian. I can't believe they pay me to do it. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> Don't anybody tell them. <laughs> questions? Oh, come on. Did I just stun you? Somebody's got to have a question. So you mentioned Patton earlier with the tank. Uh, was he during the Civil War or is that like later? Oh, no. This is just yeah, before World War II. So, but, like, you're talking about the Civil War. Right? Well, same place, different time. Little, little little time change there. <laughs> Although, you know, he had a direct ancestor, pretty close one, that was uh, a, a Confederate. Do you have anything else to say about the Grand Duke besides the Grand Duke, there's an image of the Grand Duke, not a photograph, but a drawing of it and the albatross fighting in 1863 at uh, Fort DeRussy. Before Fort DeRussy, that's the big anchor fort, so-called the Gibraltar of the South. <laughs> Piffle. Uh, it was an anti-maritime fort, and once, 1864, when, when Porter tries to fire at it and knock it out, brings the, the east port up. They fire one round, missed the fort, went right over it and started and landed amongst the Yankees who were coming up from the back. And then the, the army tells the Navy, don't do that, you're gonna kill us. And so uh, it fell pretty easily. But there was a Union officer who drew very accurately an oblique image about maybe 25, no more than 30 degrees, and you can see how, the, and he was obviously there, and you can see exactly how the Grand Duke looked. It was very tall, very majestic, had a Texas deck, hurricane deck. Tall stacks. Very tall stacks, which meant that the boilers were not particularly functional. They weren't efficient. Plus, they threw out cinders all over the place. So the, 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 the Duke uh, burned by accident. Probably a lantern was accidentally knocked over, much like the Kentucky in 65. It was not armored, armor-plated in any way. If portions of it were, they typically armored them with cotton bales. They called them cotton clads. But if they, it works uh, until the cotton catches on fire and you can't put it out, uh, as both sides found out. The, um, 
the odds are that if it had armor plate, it was less than half inch thick sheet iron, and then it was nailed up uh, against the the horizontal or the vertical surfaces, and then the the planks of the decks were not armored at all. Now, sheet iron I associated with cross body with the foundry. Is that sure. Yeah. yeah. And it was here, and it was being retrofitted. They were probably putting it in. And they had backed it up into a slough, which is now in the middle of the river, and that's it. I mean, it burned right down to the water line. Anybody else? Clarify something for me. If I can. If not, I will try not to lie. Okay. <laughs> I had always understood that banks didn't know about the road that paralleled the Red River. That's because of a guy named Wellington W. Withenbury. That's where I'm going. Who told him that there were only two roads, Winter Road and the Summer Road. One, on the east, it's the road that goes through Campty, goes up to Minden, goes to Hope, and then bends over toward the Indian Territory at, at uh, Fort Towson. The road that's on the, that's the East Road, or the Winter Road. The Summer Road is Louisiana Highway 175. And that's why he was on it. So you're saying that false intelligence is what influenced banks to come up through the forest there and get all strung out. That's exactly what I'm saying. There was no chance, and not that he would have done it, but there was no chance to send out outrigging columns. He broke every rule of tactics in the Civil War. And, you know, he was a nice guy, but he was obstinate. He was a valley girl. <laughs> if you had him at your house for dinner, he would talk about 15 minutes and be brilliant, and then the tape would start over. And that's what got him. He listened to Withenbury, and then he listened to one of his close buddies, General Dwight, William Dwight, who knew nothing, another political guy. And, he, and Dwight was smart enough to know how banks acted, and so he let everybody else talk in front of him and argue, and then Dwight would wait till they're going out, and he says, you know, General, I think, that guy makes sense. <laughs> and that's what happened. One damn blunder from beginning to end. <laughs> Good book yeah. Somebody over here. Okay, a question. So I understand when the Confederate Army knew that the Navy was coming up on their gunboats, um, they constructed dams to protect the Confederate Army from the Confederate Army coming up on their gunboats. Oh, yeah. And then the, the Pontones Bayou Dam, which was built to divert water out of the red into Bayou Pierre. And that's what Smith did. But again, that's another story. Back, back to the, the submarines. Obviously, there's a lot of research put into trying to find the submarines. Oh, what yeah. Ab what, what about the, the Missouri? Seeing that they never the Missouri was action. captured well, well, and talking. became the USS Missouri. <coughs> And along with even the Union gunboats, so that when they came up, that was it was yes, okay. it it surrendered. It was the last Confederate vessel to surrender in inland waters in the United in, in the Civil War. Now the Shenandoah is going to go on for months and months right. out in the Pacific, but uh, I found at the National Archives uh, the scrapping document for it. It was taken to Louisville along with everything else, and then it was sold for scrap. <sighs> yes, ma'am? You say you know where the submarines are not. Yep. If you were to be able to do additional searching, where would you look? Where I have not looked so far. <laughs> <laughs> There's a geologist who's from Shreveport but lives in Rolla, Missouri. And he thinks